from Microbe TV, this is Immune, episode 23, recorded on August 14th, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Welcome back. How are you? I am good. It has been really beautiful, and uh, I had a couple weeks away, so I'm, I'm good. And from Durham, North Carolina, Steph Langle. Hi there. Good to be back. Uh, the amount of time between since we've last talked is shorter than the previous <laughs> yeah. episode. So this is nice. Yes, that's the vagaries of scheduling, you know. I know. Yeah, the next know. the next gap could well be longer. <laughs> it <laughs> might well, be. <laughs> well, it might be. Did you go to Amsterdam? Was that where you were headed next, Vincent? No, I... The Netherlands. I, um, I, I'm going... Next week, I'm going to Stockholm. Stockholm. Oh, that's what it was. Saturday, uh, Sunday for a week. I'm doing three twivs there in three different places. Wow, three twivs. It's a lot. Yeah, so I was originally invited to go to a, a meeting of the Swedish Society for Virology and uh, do a very interesting twiv with Erling Norby, all about virology Nobel Prizes, because he's had... Mm-hmm. He's had some he's been on committees that decide a lot of them he's written a couple of books and then i thought while i'm there why don't i do some podcasts in stockholm so i had a couple of people i had met i met one person in rotterdam earlier this year and she said if you ever come to stockholm you know we'd be happy to have you so (laughs) hey i'm coming to (laughs) stockholm so she's arranged a podcast she's at the karolinska there's there are multiple campuses apparently so she's at one which is more clinically uh, oriented, so it's kind of clinical virology. And then the other campus of the Karolinska, another uh, TWIV listener, uh, he said, I heard you're going, you're coming to, to Stockholm, so I hooked up with him, and so that's I'm doing two TWIVs, yeah. That now, is one of those Peter Broden, is that who you, one of the TWIVs he's going to be on? It's a good question. I don't know yet. Well, I only ask because somebody had inboxed me from Karolinska telling me that he will be one of the panel members. At least that's what they said. And he's an excellent immunologist, systems immunology. We did one of his papers on um, children that are born premature and how their immune cells change over time. I'll have to look up which episode number. But but yes, so I think that'll be a good immune crossover if he, in in fact, is on the panel. Yeah, Petter Broden. Yes, and I, as we say, maybe it's Petter. It's probably yeah. Yes, Petter so I think Broden and that's Anna be great. Anna Smed Sorensen and Jan Albert. So great. Uh, Petter Broden, apparently, yeah, we did his paper on TWIV five four four. Oh, antiviral antibodies in the newborn. Yeah, yeah. So yes, that's what he yep. does. That's that's what he does. Hmm. Yep. Okay, well, why don't you come with me and ask the question? I was going to say, is there, could I come? <laughs> you know, if I had money, I'd say, yeah, for sure. I know. Did, do we want to crowdfund Cindy and I, immune <laughs> listeners, to go? <laughs> got to do it quickly because I'm leaving Sunday. I know. <laughs> Although you could leave uh, Monday because the podcast is on Tuesday. That's true. Oh, so you, he, do you know him? You know his work, I guess? So, yeah, I do. And we have communicated back and forth. So my m- the lab I'm in now and his lab are interested in very similar things, the immune development, um, both in the pregnant mother and the infant. So, yeah, the, he does great work, and that'll, I'm looking forward to that. Well, I have to ask the right questions, right? <laughs> well, yes. I could. Su- su- we could supply some. Yeah, I, that'd be fine if you would. I'm going to – Sure. I'll pick a few of his papers and let you know, and then you can – Give me some things that I wouldn't normally ask, right? Yeah, that sounds great. And then, of course, he could say anything, and I wouldn't know if he's... <laughs> no, I'm sure. It... <laughs> oh, here we go. So it's, I'm looking, um, it would have been immune episode number 12, systems immunology. Oh, yeah. the title. so we did that a was, paper on also yeah. immune. Wow, two, two different podcasts. Yes. Oh, that's so, cool. That's cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I have two podcasts on the Tuesday, next Tuesday. So in the morning is at one campus, and then the afternoon is at the other campus, and I have three guests on each one. Mm. So that'll be fun. And then uh, Wednesday I go to this meeting, and then Friday evening we have uh, the other podcast. So uh, anyway, that was a long answer to to whoever asked me where I was. (laughs) So that's that's my August travel. 
and then nice. then in September I'm going to to Copenhagen. Hmm. Then I'm gonna do two podcasts there, and then in October a few in the U.S. And then in November is Germany for the giant virus meeting. Hmm. Wow. And then so impressive sounding and giant. And then December, I just got invited at ASV to go to Singapore. Oh, nice. There is a Nipah virus meeting hmm. um, there. And uh, I'm going to speak with the people who discovered it and get the story. That'll be fun. Yeah, that's great. Have podcast, we'll travel. <laughs> Cindy, do you have any other travel? I know you're in Germany. Uh, yeah, I was in Germany. I Where am I going? No. Uh, in November, I go to the Society for Leukocyte Biology Conference. Where's that? Oh, nice. Where's that? Um, that's going to be in Boston. Mm, and long, then, tri- uh, long trip for you, huh? Yeah, no, <laughs> <laughs> not too far. <laughs> but uh, then I'm, I'm, I'm gearing up to go to AAI next year, so... Oh, are you? Okay, so it is in Hawaii. We, I think we talked about it that before. It is in Hawaii, yes. If I end up there, Vincent, you should try to come out, and then we do a three-person podcast out there. You know, when I was at ASV, a student from Hawaii came up to me, and she said, we want you to come to Hawaii to Ooh. do a podcast. And I said, yeah, I'd love to go, because uh, my wife would actually love to go on vacation, <laughs> right? So I would take her with me, and um, I could perhaps possibly, when is this meeting? It's in May. May. It's always over May. Mother's Day weekend. <laughs> yes. Which is, but hey, Vincent. I mean, your Mother's wife, Day. Mother's Day gift. Take her. Well, to listen, wife. the kids are all grown up. They don't. They don't really want to travel with us anymore. Yeah. And frankly, <laughs> not even to Hawaii. I don't. I don't. <laughs> you don't want, want to travel with them. Either. <laughs> They're in their twenties. It's they do different yeah, things. Yeah, no. and yeah, yeah. First yeah. of all, the problem is they sleep too late for me. Yes. <laughs> and mine are starting to do that. And too. the day is like half done before they. And I'm not. You know, I'm up at six. Get it. Yeah. I think when they start getting in their 30s, they'll start coming back around for some, you know, advice. I don't know. At least I found that. 20s, they go off. They do their own thing. 30s, you come back because you're, you know. My, you my just- son had a party this weekend and all these 20-somethings in there. <laughs> They're talking about sleeping late. And I said, I can't sleep late. And they said, no, don't tell us that. We're going to lose this ability. I said, yeah. <laughs> it's you will. At some point you will. That's life. Because you, yep. you have a job, mostly. <laughs> well, then you can do a lot more in the day, right? Yes. Although, you know what they do? They sleep but, late, and then they stay up all night. Yes. It's crazy. It's Can't totally crazy. Now, are you going anywhere, Steph, this year? Uh, nope, not this year, other than just holiday travel. But in mm-hmm. terms of conferences, um, yeah, work we've done so far since I've arrived at Duke, I'll, I'll hit up some of the, I'm hoping for AAI, but there's a Keystone maternal neonatal immunology I might go. It's in Colorado. So we'll see. But well, yeah, 2020 for me will be more travel. Well, I miss both of you at ASV because you were there last year, remember? I know. So oh. I Maybe was, we'll try this coming I year. was in Minneapolis and that was fun. Minneapolis is a nice place and it was a great meeting as usual. Next year it's in Fort Collins, Colorado. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Possibility. Yep. I like Colorado. It's a very nice state. Yeah. Yeah. If you like what we do here on the, our podcast, please consider supporting us financially. We could use your help. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We'll talk more about that later. And we have a follow-up email from Kim who writes, Hi, immune team. I'm Kim, a fourth-year PhD student studying lung immunology at Boston University School of Medicine. I've been a fan of TWIV for years, but was so excited when immune started. Thanks for venturing beyond your comfort zone, Vincent. <laughs> I don't know if I am. <laughs> well, listen, and beyond your comfort zone, speaking of papers that we're going to be doing today, I think each one of us goes a little bit outside our comfort zone for this. It does. Oh, yeah. Does. <laughs> I would love an excuse to go back and re-listen to transcribe all the prior episodes of Immune and provide transcripts for you moving forward as well. Please let me know if this would be welcome, as well as any helpful tips based on the TWIM transcripts being done. As always, thanks for your excellent work on the podcast. Best Kim P.S. I believe at least Vincent knows my older sister, Brianne. Brianne Barker. (laughs) Awesome. (laughs) Kim Barker. Yeah. Well, that'd be great. I mean, we talked about that. that. Well, we actually talked about it on the last episode. Yeah. Yeah. Because someone wrote in. Someone wrote in. So, Kim, I I will be in touch with you. Um I will let you know how we do it for immune for a TWIM. There are actually some programs that you can now use to run the audio through and give you a first draft, and that can help you a lot. You'll still have to correct and annotate, but it might help. Does so, it learn? Can you can you train it? I think does it, it does. Learn? I think it does. Yeah. 
Because when I when I had broken my wrist, I used uh, dragon. Dragon, dictation. yeah, dragon learns. And right. you have to teach it, but it oh, that's it, cool. It did start to work really well. I think they do. So I will I will be in touch with Kim. I, I wanted to um, read this before, and I will, I'll email you Kim, and and we can talk about the details. But that would be great, yeah, because there's not that many episodes, so you could definitely eventually get to them all. Yeah, thanks, Kim. Isn't that cool? Yeah, thank you. Okay, now it is Cindy's turn to uh, to, oh. to to inform us. <laughs> I will try. I'm going to need help on this one, so uh, we'll, we'll we'll keep it generally not in the weeds uh, detail. But I I so I picked a paper that I thought struck me as being incredibly important for all of, of immunology. But I will preface this by saying a lot of it is outside my comfort zone. Um, it's a lot of genetics, and genomics that I wasn't entirely familiar with, but I think the main points get across and I think it'll be really exciting to talk about. So it was uh, published in Immunity uh, in July, so it's very, very recent. The title of the paper is Defining Genetic Variation in Widely Used Congenic and Backcrossed Mouse Models Reveals Varied Regulation of Genes Important for Immune Responses. So um, the authors are, the first author is Chisholm, and then there's Chang, Colborn, Silva Shan- Sanchez, Metza Perez, I don't know how you say that, Randall, and the senior author is Amy Weinman. And so um, the bottom line of this paper, if we lose you at any point, is that, uh, I, I, I say a mouse is not a mouse is not a mouse, um, because what they found was that mice that we typically think are genetically identical are not. And so in immunology, we often use, uh, and I'll talk about this in a little bit, we use mice that vary in one marker so that you can track cells of two different parental genotypes in a third mouse. And so we assume that they are genetically identical and they behave the same. And in fact, they don't. And I think this, the reason why this paper is really important is because I think it's conceptually going to make us think about um, where we purchase our mice from, how we uh, annotate in our papers what genotype of mice we are using, um, and it may actually change uh, some regulations as far as uh, NIH or um, journals requiring you to put information in there about uh, where you got your mice and what exactly they are. Because um, many of us know that if you make a transgenic or a knockout, you back cross, which means you breed to the parents or breed to a pure line for a long generation, you know, a long number of generations, and you keep screening to make sure that you're your um, altered gene is still there. And we assume that after people say 10 generations or so, it's pretty much pure. And what they find is that, in fact, is really, really not the case. So have you guys used um, genetically modified mice? Yeah, sure. I remember we made transgenics, <laughs> we made transgenics years, yeah. years ago and... Uh, and did you do this? Did you back cross? No, we assume... didn't back cross at all. <laughs> you know, our <laughs> well, so, transgenics is not quite as important, right? I mean, we put the polio receptor into mice, and we were infecting. We didn't do any immunology whatsoever, but uh, you could still yeah. argue that things could be different. But I just know that whenever we'd have um, litters, they would be all different colors because yep, <laughs> <right? laughs> you'd have white ones and black ones and brown ones. <laughs> All the time, and you're just like, oh, they're pretty. Well, you know, <laughs> it's just because the 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 one you use to make the transgenics are, are a hybrid to begin with, right? Yes, and we didn't do any back crossing, and people didn't really have any issue. But if you're going to do some of the things like they do here, yeah, it's an issue. Yeah, I mean, yeah, even definitely. ten. I, mean, I don't know why we assumed that ten. Would be enough, I know. I right? that's what I thought. You know, ten. I guess is because you you know your allele of interest is retained and you don't, I mean, you still have the genes of whatever your recipient, your homozygous inbred mouse, but you, why 10 did we decide? I, <laughs> I, I mean, don't know. I, I mean, it's a nice number, but 
I think as we get more advanced in what we can actually look at, and we'll talk a little bit about that in terms of like our next generation sequencing capabilities, we're learning a lot more. And I thought I thought about what immunologists around the world were thinking when this paper dropped. It's just, I think it's going to really, like Cindy mentioned, change the way we we have to just be way more careful as if science wasn't more difficult enough. Um, what are knockouts, what our transgenic animals are telling us, because if you're like, we're going to talk about buying them from different places where they come from, what their background is, it's going to change your interpretation. Well, we often get mice from people, right? Yeah. Go, oh, let's yep, try this too. knockout. The guy down oh. the hall has it. So you get it and you do it. And now, now we shouldn't do that anymore because we don't mm, know. But you the, as you're going to tell us, they have ways maybe that we can use to see what's yes. going on. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think that when this, as Steph said, dropped, I think it was a collective uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone starts sweating. <laughs> yes. Uh, but, I mean, it's not necessarily new to immunology right. because there. I think one of the first um, big uh-ohs that we we found was there was a paper that showed that there was a difference in uh, microbiome, especially related to one particular um, bacterium called um segmented filamentous bacteria or SFB. And when that paper came out and we discovered that um, SFB was different, it was in some my the same black six mice, for example, from one vendor had it and another vendor didn't, and it influenced the immune response in the gut. So we kind of already have this to some extent. Um, we also have ideas that microbiomes can be different so mice house conventionally or in a germ-free facility or in uh, specific pathogen-free rooms at different institutions have different microbial components. And so we often, for example, um, uh, acclimate the mice for at least a week. And if we're going to do immunology studies, infection studies, we'll often share bedding or things to make sure that they have equivalent microbiomes. Uh, so that that's not a factor altering the data. So if you've got two cages in two different rooms of your knockouts in one room and your wild types in another room, for example, if you if they're you know have different microbiomes, you could actually have different results for immune mm -hmm. outcome that aren't necessarily dependent on the genotype difference. We have a guy here who. Um his whole thing was when he was a postdoc, he found, and this was in Dan Lippman's lab. Yeah. He had these two mice, same strain, one from, from different breeders. One had this bacteria in the gut and the other didn't. Right. Segmented, segmented yep. filamentous bacteria, which made a That's big right. difference in the development. Yep. Right. <laughs> right. But you know. Ilya, Ilya right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. What's his name? Um, I, I don't even know the names of my colleagues. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ivo Ivaliov or something like that. Yeah. He's Romanian. But you know, the thing is, we can do all this, but mice are nocturnal and we're making them live during the day, you know? So we yeah. covered them. that on immune <laughs> yeah. too, right? Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's just that the bottom, you know, beneath all this, we're totally screwing them up and nobody ever talks about it, right? It's just for our convenience so we can go in during the day and do our thing, right? And the temperature. Right. We, we mm -hmm. keep the yep. temperature at a good good temperature for humans but not for mice so yeah i mean so we have to we have to be cognizant of this that we're going to go over in this paper but in reality we do the best we can with what we have mm -hmm. and i think that the thing we always have to keep in mind as researchers is just say what you did you know you you do what you did you made a choice for a particular reason as long as you outline in detail what you did then you know we we can interpret based on that. They say something there's in, never the, a perfect in the discussion right? that they say all experiments are imperfect. <laughs> right. It's true. It's right. And that's, right? It. that's basically it. So and, you're and, right. You, you know, have the good, yeah. you have the moderated view. There's some people, of course, who say all mouse work is crap. Well, that's... Mm, right? Yeah. That's the opposite. Yeah, I mean... And there are, pe they, there are people, and you can read articles by them in journals who say all this is useless because of this and this and this, and that's the other extreme. Well, you know, yes, but, but if you're do, planning but, on taking something into a human immediately, yeah, it's not going to be highly relevant. But we learn a lot from this. No, yeah, totally. You have to do things in mice and other animal models for sure. And then, you, as you say, you have to, you can't say this is it. You have to further test them. My, right. Mice lie and monkeys exaggerate. That's what we say. <laughs> yes, yes. That's what we say. Yeah, exactly. 
And a lot of the historical fundamental immunology discoveries, I mean, histocompatibility, MHC restriction, thymic yep. education, I mean, it was all yeah, sure. using mouse models like this. But of course, coming from a background where I use pigs, I see the other side where if you have only homozygous inbred mouse strains, what is that really telling you? And so I like this paper because it kind of talks to the limitations of mice. But of course, this paper offers us a way to what Cindy's saying, recognize the your limitations of your model so you can report that. So so getting into the background for this, um, do you guys do you guys have hobbies? <laughs> Um, Vincent, do you have hobbies other than podcasting? Podcasting? <laughs> I, I don't. I mean, I don't, I like there's, nothing I, there's nothing I do at home. When I go home, I read about viruses. But no, I don't have yeah. hobbies. No. I consider... You know, Viruses science. Science is my hobby. Yeah, well, I I have uh, I have a couple of dogs. I really love state parks, so we, I enjoy hiking. I enjoy yeah, um, anything outdoors. So that's one thing. There's a couple others, but what about you, Cindy? <laughs> yeah, I, I I try to exercise, but yeah, I read about vaccines. I guess. Yeah. Well. <laughs> I mean, I cut so the, I, I cut the gra- on that. I cut the grass, but it's not <laughs> a hobby. It's something I have well, to no, do. That's sort of a torture, right? <laughs> uh, well, I don't mind. It's, Some it's people the only, think it's meditative. It's the only exercise I get, but I do get to think a lot while I'm. Yes, yeah, for sure, exactly. I get to think yeah. uninterrupted. But anyway, uh, there there was a purpose to this, and that <laughs> is that did you know that we wouldn't have any of these mice if there wasn't a woman who or a number of people whose hobby it was was to breed mice. Yes, that's correct. Someone brought them over from Europe at one point. They right? did. So so in the 17th century Japan, it was actually a, a an aristocratic hobby to breed fancy mice. Fancy and, mice. Well, yeah, fancy mice. And so so there was this, the, the history of this is there was this woman, Abby Lathrop, who lived in Massachusetts, and she had a, a farm and a barn where she bred lots of different things and ferrets and rabbits and mice. And she had over 10,000 mice that she raised in her barn. Oh my God. Can you imagine? Were they, you were imagine? they in cages or just running around? I, yeah, I think they were in cages to cages. some extent, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, so so the story goes that she was a very savvy businesswoman and she would sell these mice to people who liked fancy mice. And there happened to be an individual at Harvard who wanted to study short lifespan. So he was actually a researcher. His name was William Ernest Castle. And so he got these mice from her and his grad student was tasked with inbreeding um, some mice to see if they could generate a pure line. And so this grad student's name was C.C. Little and C.C. Little created the DBA mouse. So mm-hmm. Have you heard of the DBA mouse? So it's a dilute brown non-agouti um, is just the color coat. And so it's the oldest inbred line known. It's now known as DBA2. <laughs> yeah. So, but um, when when this guy started inbreeding these mice, Lathrop said, hmm, maybe I should inbreed mice too. So she liked black coat colors. So she bred and bred and came up with the C57 black mouse. So that's the standard mouse that most people use in their research. There was a, there's a story where Swiss mice were Came from Switzerland. Some some lady brought them over they in her dress or so, something, yeah, right? Or something like that. <laughs> Maybe I missed that one, but that's a f- cool story. Interesting. Too. Yeah. I imagine so, it came over on a boat, I guess, but she had them in her dress for the whole trip. Oh, no, thank you. <sighs> oh, my you. gosh. I have lots of questions about that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I want to do that. I, I'm not, we, uh, I'm not like squirmish of mice, but. You know, anyway, I don't know about keeping mice in my dress or <laughs> 10,000 in my barn or a garage or whatever. But anyway, so so she inbred these mice and she so she came up with this C57 breeder stock and she worked with someone at Penn named Leo Loeb, Loeb, Loeb or something. And um, anyway, he decided to start a, a, um, a business and that is now the Jackson Lab. Hmm. Very cool. And so they have over 7,000 different strains of mice. So I'm sure they have many more than 10,000 mice with 7,000 strains. But yeah, so um, so a lot of these uh, mouse strains are derived from those original ones. So here, here's a question for you. Can you guess how many mice are used in research every year? Whew. You mean globally or just? Yep, globally. 
Oh my gosh. Oh my Every year, millions, I would imagine. 90 million. Yeah. 90 million. We have to be very thankful for the, for the mouse. Yeah. It does a so, lot for us. And it, it really does a lot for us. And so, and Steph, you mentioned a few things, but really it's been fundamental in helping us um, dissect and uncover and understand the immune system. You can knock out different cells. You can knock out different genes and see how you can challenge them with bacteria and viruses. And we can determine the role that all these different genes play in host defense. We understand antigen presentation. We understand vaccines. All of these have been amazing things that we have discovered by using mice. And you can add genes. You could add trans genes. You can add genes. Right. You can make virus m- models for viral and bacterial and fungal infections. Yeah. Right. And so one of the things that immunologists do is they make bone marrow chimeras. And I believe we've talked about this before. But generally, you take and wipe out the immune system in one animal and you replace it with the um, stem cells from another animal. Um, that then that will repopulate. You put hematopoietic stem cells and that will repopulate with, you know, deficient in a certain gene or a marker in a certain gene or whatever. And another thing that we tend to do is not only just make a bone marrow chimera, but make a mixed bone marrow chimera in which you can track because maybe the knockout cell and the wild type cell behave differently when you put them in together versus on their own. And so in order to be able to pull back out those individual genotypes when you've made this mixed bone marrow chimera, we use markers that can differentiate between the two. And so these are called congenic mice or congenic markers. And a common one is CD45. And so that's basically marks all lymphocytes or all all immune cells. And so they can be CD45.1 or 0.2. And so we have antibodies that can distinguish those isoforms of CD45. So you can mix wild type cells that are CD45.1 with knockout cells of that are CD45.2, mix them together and put them into a, a mouse in which you've wiped out the immune system. And then you can look at how those different cells perform in the context, in that context. However, we're going to find out that maybe that's not as easy as one would think, um, which right, is related because to this genetic basis behind that was that although, you know, they were detected by different antibodies, they really behave the same. That was the exactly assumption the behind these these two different types of mice strains, congenic mice. Right. And the assumption is that that's the only place they're different. Right. right. Except for again, what you've messed up. It, so if you have again, a wild type and a knockout, right. the only thing that's different is this marker so that you can functionally compare them. So, yeah. So the other thing you need to know is about how knockouts and transgenics are made. So knockouts, you usually make them in one background because they're particularly amenable to knockout for whatever reason. We have a 129, which is one of these strains of mice like DBA or black cysts or balbsy. So these ES cells come from 129. You knock out the gene, both alleles in those cells, and then you put them into a blastocyst and it grows up into a mouse and you breathe and you back cross and typically we back cross to a black six because most of the knockout strains, for whatever reason, I don't know why we didn't keep it on 129 to begin with, but we we make them and we back breed them to black six. So whenever you get a knockout, you need to check, but probably 80 to 90% of the time they're on the black six background. And so you can then compare knockouts and wild types on black six and use the black six as a control wild type, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how those are made. The other thing that you need to know is um, the with microbiome studies, um, and we we have you know we mentioned uh, SFB, but that's not the only thing. Different microbiomes can cause inflammation or be protective or whatever. And the way people study this is they derive mice into a germ-free environment. So basically, they take pregnant mice and they give them a C-section into a completely clean environment, so those mice grow up. <laughs> excuse me, um, without any bacteria at all. So none on the skin, none on the fur, none in the gut, none in the lungs, nowhere. And they use these to try and understand what the bacteria are doing to develop different things and how these mice ha- might have deficiencies, et cetera, et cetera. And often what people will do is they will, co- they will co-house these germ-free mice with 
wild type mice with their own microbiome. And then those, those germ-free mice will pick up that microbiome. And it's thought that the microbiome secretes various different things that can modulate immune responses. So um, that that's an important concept that'll come up at the very beginning because when they tried to do this, it revealed that there were differences that were probably not microbiome mediated. Right. Um, that that led them down this path for this particular paper. So um, the the last thing I really want to introduce is um, chip seek. So there's this process called chromatin immunoprecipitation, where you can Im- immunoprecipitate chromatin based on markers that are on histones, and then you can sequence what's associated with that. And so what what people have done is they've used this kind of approach to ask where transcription factors are sitting on the genome or where the genome is marked with um, nucleosomes that have modifications that indicate that they're active, so it's actively transcribed. And so you can look at how the epigenetics, which is those modifications of the nucleosomes, are different between different strains of mice. And it's an extremely sensitive system, and you can scan across the entire genome because you can sequence all these different fragments, and you can find out where these differences are. And so... Um, I sort of come back to saying there's a lot of assumptions that we make based on reagents that we use, including mice. And so we have known knowns and known unknowns and unknown knowns and unknown unknowns. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so trying to, to limit the number of boxes that are black to you, obviously unknown unknowns are always unknown. But now we know that our genetics might be different in our mice that we think are genetically identical. So it just raises the idea that we need to think more carefully about how we use mice and what, if you do see a difference, what it's actually due to. Right. And there was uh, one of our previous episodes kind of touched on this, although we didn't directly bring it up, but I will go back. But I think it was talking when we were about pyroptosis and we we're talking about caspases. And in that mm-hmm. paper, they were using caspase um, 11 knockout mice and, and really- right. Right. And because of this issue where um, this original embryonic stem cells from this 129 strain, um, th- it knocked out caspase one. And so what that did in these early uh, studies of caspase was it really mischaracterized the role of that protein in innate immunity. So if you want to go back and listen to that episode and, and, and with this one, it's kind of a nice way to look at it in action. But I think, again, Cindy, these assumptions are huge. And the reason I think they're being challenged is because now we have the technology to look at it uh, like this paper does. Right. And so if I look back at these kinds of studies, I wouldn't say necessarily that they were wrong. They were right with the information and the technology and the tools that they had at the time. Yes. But now we have different ways of evaluating this and we reveal things that we didn't know before. And I think that's important because you don't want to blame people for making incorrect evaluations or invalidating a whole set of literature. It's just that now we know more. And so we need to go back and, and reevaluate what we what we thought. And I think that applies to all areas of life, too. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And it, what it will do is just make things you just would have to be more rigorous with and, and more thorough to confirm that your model is actually revealing what you are looking to reveal and what your hypothesis is. That's right. So, so what this paper originally set out to do is they wanted to ask <clears throat> if the microbiome affected T cell function. So why might one think this? Well, I mentioned it. Micro, the microbiome is the, all the bacteria that live in your gut and elsewhere on your body uh, or the body of a mouse. And they can secrete, we now know, they can secrete molecules that can go into the bloodstream and they can affect cells. And the function of cells. And so uh, one of these m- metabolites is short chain fatty acids, and they've been shown to play a role in a number of different things. And so they really wanted to know did this play a role in T cells and T cell function? And so to start, they isolated CD4 and CD8 T cells from conventionally housed or germ free mice, which is exactly what anybody would do to do this study. So with bugs, without bugs. They take them in vitro, polarize them to the TH1 or TC1, and then they looked at these uh, markers of activity on the nucleosomes. It's called a histone 3 
um, lysine 27 acetylation. So you have an antibody to that, you pull it down and then you sequence and you find out where in the genome do do they have these marks and you can look all across the genome and what they found were differences. So they were like, awesome, microbiome is affecting T cells. So they wanted to confirm this. So they confirmed it by PCR. These differences were all good. That's great. So what do you do next is exactly what I said. You co-house the germ-free mice with the conventional mice and they are going to transfer the microbiome and then voila, the T cells should behave just like the conventional mice and not the germ-free mice. And the marker should be the same. And guess what? They weren't. <laughs> wah, wah, wah. <laughs> right. So, so one could stop there and say, okay, well, you know, it's not due to the microbiome. So what is it? And so their first clue was, I guess they tasked someone with mapping where the differences were. And it turns out that almost every difference they saw was on chromosome one. And so that would be unexpected. I don't know a lot about genomics and genetics, but I would think that those differences should be spewed throughout right. a, a cr across the genome. And they all seem to be on chromosome one. And they said, hmm, that's kind of weird. And so um, they went and looked at uh, the the backgrounds. I don't I don't know how they would have figured this out because it wasn't something that I would have thought of. But eventually, they figured out that their germ free mice that they bought and were housing had the CD forty five point one marker, and the conventional mice had the CD forty five point two marker. So they said, "Hmm, maybe the genes surrounding this on chromosome one." are different because there's a small chunk of the genome that's left in the one strain of mice when they back cross to make this congenic strain. So they retain some DNA from the CD45.1 background, which was called SLJ, in the germ-free mice, and that's why they're different. And so why, so who cares, right? So it's a small chunk of the genome that's retained from the previous, from a different strain of mice. Why would that make any difference? Well, turns out that that particular part of the genome encodes a whole bunch of genes related to immune function. Yeah. So yes. that's a big oops. <laughs> so <laughs> when, when they, when they were looking at congenic markers to look at differences between immune cells, they chose this lymphocyte, like it's a lymphocyte marker. If anybody looks for, a, not lymphocyte, any immune cell, if they look for an immune cell, they use CD45. That's the marker that tells you it's an immune cell, right? And it turns out that, of course, that's in an area where there's a whole bunch of immune, immune genes. Uh, that are encoded. So they said, okay, well, one of these genes is cathepsin E. And guess what cathepsin E does? It's important in chopping up antigens for a presentation on MHC. So this could actually have some <laughs> pretty real, real fundamental. implications <laughs> yes. in, in what we're doing. So, um, so why is this expression different? So what, what is it about this region that might be different? So first of all, they, they looked at cathepsin E. They showed it was actually differentially expressed in the 45.1s and the 45.2s. And when they explored it by looking at the sequencing, it turns out there was a long terminal repeat inserted into one of the um, um, congenic ones, a CD45 or one or two. And that actually changed the expression level of the gene of Vincent, Vincent, were you excited when you saw LTRs? Well, did your ears poke up? So <laughs> I don't know why they think it's viral because there are lots of LTRs in genome yeah. that, that jump around. Mm -hmm. They're not they're they're, they're transposon based, right? They were originally, yeah. No, no, they weren't. They no? were they were no? LTRs before retroviruses. Man, oh. Many people many people get this wrong all the time. They say okay. it's viral. So there were retrotranspose there were transposons, retrotransposons containing reverse transcriptase with LTR before retroviruses. Mm -hmm. They they gave rise to retroviruses when they acquired a right. uh, an envelope like a protein to allow them to make particles. But long before these viruses were circulating, our genomes had these transposable elements that had everything in, it, it, that a retrovirus has except for the glycoprotein and the capsid protein. So, mm. so I guess that's a one, misnomer. So they say right, they integration of a viral long terminal repeat. That's right. And they say seven and a half KB in length. Now, first of all, no LTR is seven and a half KB in length. 
So <laughs> I don't know what they mean by the LTR is less than a KB. It's only a piece of, oh, the, of the transposon. Yeah. I suspect this is a transposon because mm -hmm. they don't tell us why they think it's viral. It, it, what would make it viral would be to have a glycoprotein mm -hmm. gene, which um, is clear. You know, mice have all the time and they jump around, but transposons mm -hmm. can jump around. So I suspect that's what happened. It just. Yeah, so I, I thought that was cool, but it's not surprising because these, whether it's an endogenous retrovirus or a transposon, they always move around the genome, and you could right. you could imagine it's going to be different from different mouse strains, right? Yeah, yeah, fair enough. So the bottom line is, this stuck into the gene and it inactivated it, right? That's right, or it lowered the expression level, yeah. knocked it out in some in some cells, and so one one might say, well, okay, but does that really affect anything? you know, widespread in all of the different types of mice that we use. So they went and they screened mice and they looked for expression of this cathepsin E. So was it at high level or low or lost? And they looked at whether or not by PCR they had this LTR, which we'll just call an LTR. We won't call a viral LTR or anything else, um, transposable element. Um, and what happened was any time that the, the strain of mouse had that insertion, they had very little expression of cathepsin E. So it was a one-to-one -one correlation. So it just suggests that in some strains of mice, they have this, uh, this transposable element that popped into the gene and affects expression. Um, so, okay. So one might want to know, well, how, how widespread is this? Um, and how, how would, could we possibly ever look at this? And so... What they did was, and this is supposed to be the crux of the paper, which I think most of the immunologists will gloss over, but they created a method, a, a, a computer-based method to screen to see how frequently this type of thing happens. And for for those of you out there who are into genetics and genomics, this is going to be way too simple because I'm not sure I actually understand it. But basically, what they used was a little secret. Um, it's the Genomics dirty little secret is, I guess, the way. And I, I actually loved that because it was you know, all just dirty little secret that gave us an immunity. <laughs> da, da, da. But anyway, the whole point was that um, the the way they align reads in these next gen sequencing um, platforms is they give some flexibility because there are errors in sequencing and so forth. So they allow it to have a little wiggle room. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so what happens is you can get annealing where it's not exactly right. And so you think that all of these strains of mice might have the same sequences when they might not. And so what they asked was, could they use a more stringent approach so that they could pick up right. when these sequences were there in one strain and not in another? And so they did it two different ways. They, they inspected the sequences and did a computer-based approach. And then they also did a visual approach because I guess it can it can visualize the sequences and you can scan across and you look for areas in which they don't they don't align perfectly. So that's if you guys understand it any differently than that, please speak up because that's about my extent of my knowledge. No, of how that's, they do this. that's exactly okay. right. That's perfect. Yeah, <laughs> that's okay. the way I read it. Yeah. And it's really okay. it's you know it's very I mean simple but ingenious because you can then see the differences between that reference what they're referencing within that um, the software. And make it more strict and then see what's left out. I, I mean, it's, That's right. it's simple, but it's, it's great. So the argument they make is that you can retroactively go and look at all of the RNA-seq data that are out there and look, use a similar approach to find out what genes are different in different strains of and, mice and in a particular cell type. You should probably tell us what RNA-seq data are. Yeah, so it's RNA sequencing. So you take all of the RNA from a cell, you put barcodes on it, and then you sequence it in on mass, and that tells you what those that particular cell population was making at any point in time. Yeah, it's right. the total total RNA of the cell, right? That's right. Um, so when they did this, they identified um, the the region that was different between these different strains and. Um, they they looked at specific immune genes that might be different, and they focused on one that's called CXCR4, and you might know that because it's an HIV receptor. Mm -hmm. um, it's also important for a bunch of different things, including recruiting cells to the lymph node and so forth. So this work gets really interesting because now they said, okay, well, let's get 
that's by black six mice or whatever the background was. Um, black, it's B six dot S L J C D 45.1 in case you're S J L an, if, an aficionado. Did I, what did I say? S S L J. S L J. Oh, S J L. Sorry. I did. I wrote it. I typed it. Back <laughs> um, but so they bought those same mice. So it's, the, the same, we're not talking CD 45.1 and 45.2. We're talking about the same exact strain of mice from Jackson to Connick or Charles River. And they asked, uh, do they have the same expression of the CXCR4 and are there differences? And that's really kind of scary because they were different. <laughs> <laughs> they have a beautiful graphic way of displaying they, it, right? They it's do. Lovely. Yeah. It's lovely. You yeah, can yeah. just look you at colors. You can look at colors and you can see. Yeah. <laughs> and you can see that they're not the same, which is kind of scary, I think. Because you, it's one thing if you think you're, you've, you've bred some mice and you assume that they're the same. But if you get a black six mouse from one vendor or another vendor, you would hope. Right that they're the same. Right. So when you say you hope they're the same, what do you actually mean? You, you'd say that... That they're genetically identical. Well, of course, that's never the case anyway, right? Because there's always poly... They can get mutations. That's right. I mean, even within a within us or within any multicellular organism, every cell has a different DNA sequence, right? Because that's just right. the way... Because that's DNA is true. Prone. But how... So when you say identical, and the, how how identical are you talking about? Of course, here they're know. not they're not close because if you just look at these patterns, you can see there are lots of differences. So there are lots of differences. One would hope there aren't that many differences, right? Yeah. So right. yes, you can have genetic differences, but how much of your genome is actually exons? And when you have a mutation, how many actually end up in a non synonymous mutation? That and of those, how many would change function? Right. Right. So mm. so it's not that frequent, I would think that if you have the identical strain of mice that you are breeding at two different facilities over time, that they should be that different. You can have mutations that change things. So for example, a strain that I am interested in, which is the C3H, HE mice, because uh, HEJ and HEN, one of them has a mutation in TLR4. And that's actually one of the ways in which they mapped and identified the LPS receptor was using that difference. And so like HEN is from NIH originally and HEJ is from Jackson. So sometimes you can find what the origin of, of a mouse strain is. But generally, if you've got a SLJ CD45.1 on a black six background, you would as tend to assume that there are few, if any, gen genome differences that result in a difference in amino acid sequence that also results in a change in function. I think in this picture, in this image on figure four, it's, which is a heat map of yes. the differences. I think yep. at that level, which is a 10,000 foot level or maybe 2,000 feet, I don't know. It's not It's not a nucleotide by nucleotide level. Right. There, you would probably expect that Jackson, Taconic, and Charles River would have really the same coloring patterns. Right, and, right. And, you know, because the individual changes you wouldn't see unless there were a lot of them. So mm -hmm. that's, I think that's probably the metric when you would say we would hope the mice are identical, right? Yeah. Because they're not going to yeah. be, they're not going to have the same DNA sequence. It's never going to happen. Right. Because just in the breeding, there will be changes. But at this high level that they get in this uh, visualization, I think. It right. Should at this, like transcriptional and protein level. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I guess, you know, in the end, there were, there were a lot more differences than one would have anticipated. And um, what they found was that uh, in some of the mice, so on, on chromosome one, they saw differences around this, um, the CD45 locus in um, uh, some of the mice, but then on another mouse, differences were on a different chromosome. So it's not just related to where the CD45 uh, gene is inserted. So there's there's more widespread differences among different um, different mice they should be the same mouse strain across different vendors. Right. So are these differences on multiple chromosomes or on one chromosome? Because you mentioned one before. So one is on chromosome one, and some of the mice, ha um, some of the strains have differences on chromosome 19, and one of them has difference on right. chromosome seven. And, seven. and other chromosomes are similar, right? Yeah. So I would have liked to see the similar ones 
Mm. Just at, even in supplementary For data, reference. just yeah, say true. this is what we would expect the mice to look like, right? So I guess in the heat map that they show, all all the chromosomes are there. Not all of them, but some of them are there. Yeah, they have the. Um, they have I guess they one. only show the ones that have the bigger differences, but. Yeah, well, yeah. I can't really tell because you're right. On the right, they have chromosome 1, 10, 11, 13, right? All yeah. That, but I don't understand the color. Where yeah, that, I got yeah. <laughs> where that's coming from. Unless that so that bar on the left. I'm Maybe sorry. I'm sorry for our listeners that we're doing this. But yeah, I know. Uh-huh. Did you see the bar on the left in PLA? Yes. That range yeah, of colors that tells you which chromosome. Maybe that tells you yep. which chromosome. So they looked yep. at quite a few, but not all yep. of them, right? Not but all. They, right. Yeah, not all of them. Um. So, hmm. yeah. Uh, in the end, this is really important because th- these are not just any gene. These are often the differences are in immune related genes. So we talked about cathepsin E is one that's important in antigen processing and presentation. Talked about CXCR4, which will be important for some viral infections. It's important for um, uh, recruitment of cells to lymph nodes and so forth. And then there's also CD62 ligand, which is a key one in neutrophil rolling and transmigration. So those just those genes alone, if they were different, is going to completely change the immune capacity of the mouse. So that that's a big difference. And when they looked at um, forty different genes that were differentially expressed among these um, that were immune related, there were at least twenty that were twofold different in what should have been identical mice from different vendors. So when these are immune related, it's it really could potentially you know, affect more widespread the functionality. So how do you look at function? Well, in my opinion, this was the the downfall of the thing. I got all excited because I was like, oh, they're looking at flu. One, Vincent will love this. And two, they're going to show us that it's functionally different. And the bottom line of these experiments are that they did look at um, T follicular helper cells, which express CXCR4, and it's important for um, their functionality and for antibody production and for, you know, just for B cells in general in um, germinal centers and lymph nodes. And so they already know that they're, it's differentially expressed. And so they look in flu and they challenge them, but they don't actually see whether they're protected. They don't look at the, the viral lows. They don't, they don't really look at much of any of that, mm. but they do show that the flu induces um, T follicular helper expression of CXCR4 and that the ones that have the genetic difference fail to upregulate that. And they suggest that that's evidence that there's differential function in the immune system. And yeah, so, this section drove me crazy because if you yeah. have already challenged them, I'm assuming they weren't different. Probably and not, that's yeah. and, and that's Probably why. Not. And so that kind of brings me back to a couple of the things they, they brought up. For instance, you know, when you talk about Cathepsin E, I mean, it's important in antigen presentation. Well, maybe why people really haven't either noticed this or had any concern about it is because it doesn't have a, a, a function that difference that you can measure between the two. So maybe look at antigen presentation and see if the function of that transcript is affected. Because I think it's one thing to look at, uh, you know, I think they did transcript and protein levels, but if they're not doing function... I think that that was the lacking part of this paper. So I guess means that depending on what you're looking at, these differences may or may not make a difference, right? That's right. Uh, yeah, right. And maybe there's some compensatory mechanisms that allow that those differences to be, it's fine. And that's a lot to ask, right? I mean, this was a very hardy paper. If we were to ask them to do functional studies on all of these different things they found that were different, it's for another paper, I'm sure. But I think... Yeah, what you mentioned, saying the flu, it was a little disappointing, but I mean, it's it's surely still important. And I don't know if they could have maybe tried a different virus. I mean, they tried flu, but I don't really, did they say why? I mean, just... Mm, no. <laughs> I mean, maybe HIV if CXCR4 is implicated. They say um, because it's known that uh, CXCR4 can play a role in, in, in homing in this infection, but... right. I right, guess it's right. Been shown for that. That's not. But the, then yeah. we would need to see like homing data, or yeah, you know, yeah. 
Yeah, I feel like they they chose um, an assay which they know should be different to <laughs> yeah, sure. Point. Right. But, you know, right. I mean, my my thought on this was these people were really genomics people and they discovered this method and they found it was related to immune genes and they tried to throw something immune related to it um, so that they could, you know, validate what they were doing. So they probably don't have the expertise for that. But they could have they could have collaborated with someone who did have the expertise. Sure. But, you know, maybe, maybe they are. They say they just they, maybe they are and they just, you know, you can keep pumping out data and, you know, collaborate, but eventually you got to just get the paper out. So that could yep. have been it. Could have been it too. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, that's one example. And what they decided to do was do another example. So if I understood this experiment correctly, what they did was they had um, TBX21, which is the TBET gene, which is important for TH1 differentiation, which this is what they started with was, does the microbiome affect TH1 cells through metabolites was their original question. And so they're still interested in TH1 cells. And so they the knockouts for the TBX21 gene were made on 129 and backcrossed um, a bunch of different generations. Um, and then they compared them that were back cross to the black six on the CD45.2 background to CD45.2 black six that were not TBX2 deficient. So in this case, you're looking at a specific knockout. This is different from what they were doing before. They were just saying before, if you've got a black six or you've got a BALBC or you've got a, you know, Black six from Taconic or Jackson. How are they different? This is the, the these were a knockout that was specifically made to assess immune function, and has been used on forty five point one and forty five point two background in bo- mixed bone marrow chimeras to evaluate function of Tibet intrinsic activity. Right, mm-hmm. and so they compared these to the CD forty five point two, and what they found were there were a lot of differences, and they were related to immune genes that are kind of really important. Things like CX- CCR seven, which is a, a chemokine that's important for recruiting cells, um, and then uh, cyclin dependent kinases, and a bunch of other things that they were actually non synonymous mutations that affected protein function, and they confirmed the differences. And so what they what they were saying here was that even if you back cross, which you think should create what's considered a congenic strain. So you've got your control mice and you've got your knockout mice, then the um, there are there are still differences. Um, and they can depend on the vendor. They can pe- depend on how much you've back crossed. Um, and the last thing they said was that um, even litter mates might not be the best. <laughs> control and I was like what can you possibly do um <laughs> because the litter mates might actually have different genetics around the knockout than the knockout mm, yeah sure. I, don't, I don't even know what you do at that point what do, well what do this you do? this is what I was going to ask so they've developed a method where you could look at sequence RNA seq right. data and say yes. the mice I'm using you know other differences that could affect my results Right. right. So that they say it's an Im- important for immunologists to have the ability to assess whether genetic variation might be a relevant variable. Right. So that's one thing. Or you could just re-derive all the mice and make them identical mm-hmm. or as identical mm-hmm. as you can so you don't have mm-hmm. differences in litter mates. That's crazy, right? <laughs> right. So I guess the argument would be to use CRISPR, right, to knock out mm-hmm. specifically your one gene yeah, but keep exactly. it on the same background. Exactly. You know, but the yeah. thing is, whatever you're doing with your particular mouse strain from Jack's may be different from somebody else's, That's which right. is from Taconic, and they've done the same exact CRISPR thing, and they're getting different yeah, results. Right. Could, right. So right. it seems to me the best thing to do would be for everyone, if you want to use your mice, what, C3H, you said? Everybody has mm-hmm. to have the same C3H. Start with the same C3H. And Jackson and Charles River and... Uh, Taconic are going to have to harmonize. Hmm. That would mm. seem to make more sense than than looking at RNA seq data for every mouse. Yeah, that's crazy. I mean, <laughs> that would be the most logical. But can you imagine trying to tell those three, you know, giant companies that they have to have the same? I mean, I guess they could, but as long as they could still make money from it, 
I think that's going to that would be a challenge. I th- yes, I agree. You that's can't make that. They'd have to say, okay, you're going. We're going to keep your black six. We're going to keep your, you know, Balbsi, and they'd have to go down the line and say which yeah. ones they were going to keep from the three, and then the other two would have to k- call their entire colony. Oh. I mean, right? it would be insane. And then re-derive. Yeah. So, so <laughs> they let's, would never say for, let's say, for example, we decide to have Jackson's Black Six Day. So all the other vendors have to, to sack all their Black Six mice and get the breeders from Jackson and start their right. own colony again. That's going to massively economically... That would be insane. eviscerate those companies for a long right. time. And, but right? how, do you, how do you know which one so, is the right one, though? That, exactly. Well, right. Well, there right. is no right one. They're all artificial. There's, <laughs> yeah, they're all wrong, right? <laughs> I think Jackson would say that they were the originals, so that they're the correct ones. I like, think they they have some legs to stand on there, based on our original story, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Based on. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I I'm I, I'm in a loss on how one. Um, conceptually interprets all these data and what you're actually going to do with them as an immunologist in the lab. They don't really give you any help. All they say is you're going to have to sequence your mice, essentially, right? Yeah, I yeah. mean, they, they give you this tool, this, yeah, you know, yeah, exactly. bioinformatics but I think, tool, but that's... <laughs> I think that's not terribly practical, and it still makes it hard for labs to compare results, because you don't know how, even if you have differences, you don't know how they interact, and how they would change your results from lab to that's lab. Right. It's 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 best to have the same mice, but I think that's really hard also. So I don't know what the solution is. Well, really, I, I think... think it, oh, go ahead. go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I think all of this would take labs a lot more time to, to do research. And so there's not going to be an innate driver to to do this and so it would have to come down i think from from the funding agencies that you have to do xyz because otherwise it's I, I don't think labs will take i mean thorough labs would of course but i don't know it's i think it would just have to come from the top down if it's going to be something you know consistent i think it would divide scientists because there are some that could be able to afford to do that exactly it would be challenging yes, totally. yeah um, yeah so, this is, so it will that's divide. what i wanted to mention it's already expensive to do mouse work this is going to mm-hmm. make it more expensive because you're going you to have to have rna seq yeah. data now here's the mouse strain we used and here are the rna seq data showing the genes in the area of what we we're looking at whatever i guess like you have to do the whole genome you can't just do one chromosome right 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 so i wanted to bring up something else that's kind of related but very different and that is and i think we should do a paper that illustrates this uh, in the future and that is another kind of mouse called the collaborative cross which i think mm-hmm. both of you oh, have yeah. heard mm-hmm. about right so here in 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 infectious diseases when we infect all these lab mice that Cindy's been mentioning today these are highly inbred even though they're different <laughs> they're still highly inbred and they don't even come close to representing the genetic diversity of humans. And so mm-hmm. you can infect, you could buy all the different mouse strains you want, and, so, and sometimes your virus won't infect them mm-hmm. because it's not the right genome. And okay. so the collaborative cross, uh, what they have done is taken a thousand inbred mouse lines and crossed them all in a very specific way. It's an eight-way funnel breeding design, which they cause, which they call it. And then you get essentially incredible genetic diversity that begins to approach that of humans. And then you can take these mice and you can start with a certain number. And let's say I have a virus that doesn't infect black six or one two nine or C three H mice, right? I can find a collaborative cross mouse that will be infected by that virus. Hmm. Because it's oh. got diverse some gene in it that isn't changed in a certain way in all the other strains, and then you can map it. You can map the susceptibility, and eventually figure out genes that uh, allow viruses to to replicate in mice. So for this was done with Ebola virus, which you have to adapt to these inbred mice to get it to replicate at all, and they found a, a series of collaborative cross mice that range from being infected with Ebola and nothing happens all the way to hemorrhagic fever, fever that completely mimics what happens in people. Mm. And you can map wow. and you can map the the genes they're called loci, quantitative trait loci. Trait loci QTLs. QTLs. Yep. 
And eventually, if you're lucky, you can get it down to a single gene and say, why does this allow the virus to replicate? Is it a receptor? Mm. Is it an immune gene or something else? So that's the advantage of, the, of kind of, this is outbreeding, really. <laughs> it's taking, yeah, it is. They took right. all the available mouse lines and they just mix them all together and you get outbred mice. And for certain experiments, that's good. For viruses, that's good because it allows us. So, you know, we're, we're, we'd like to use that to make a mouse model for a virus for which there is none. Right, and right. And so it takes advantage of diversity, whereas for, for immunology, you want it to be harmonized, right? You want the mice to be all the same, although we learned today that they're not real. So <laughs> collaborative cross takes the opposite approach, and, and, and which I think is an interesting contrast. Right? Mm-hmm. Well, no, it's great. And I think, I mean, we're going to have to start thinking more, you know, heterogeneously because a lot, you you can really just type mouse research and find that there's a lot of struggles to translate it into human applications. And of course, we always talk about, we learn a lot mechanistically from our, you know, uh, mouse studies or in vitro studies. But if we're going to, we have to consider the variability as you, as the collaborative cross does. That's great. And I guess the extreme of that is people using the the pet shop mice or the outbred mice, right? Wild mice. Yeah. <laughs> or another animal model, like pigs. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Anything else? Wow. Anything else? I, I, think I, that's, I don't. It's a bear of a paper, but I that's think. That's a good. No, I think it was. No, I broke it down. Job. It's a good job. Kind of the, Very the, good. The, oh. And then the, the thing is, we don't know what's going to happen. We're, we're, no. we're waiting to see. Right. Uh, right. The, Im- right. the impact this has. It will take a while, probably. Uh, Should we do email? Yeah, let's do some email. That uh, first one is written to you, Cindy. Ah, okay. Dear Cindy, this is anonymous, by the way. Um, I'm writing at the recommendation of my friend who studies HIV vaccines as a postdoc. Some background. I'm a trained engineer, an MS in mechanical engineering, and someone who likes to dive into details. As such, I have found it immensely frustrating as a new, admittedly anxious new mother wading through information related to vaccines, because when I spot apparent inconsistencies or have other unanswered questions, I'm unable to find the answers I need to assuage my concerns without doing a full-blown literature review. The questions below represent just two examples of those types of concerns. So I can completely understand how you feel. It's overwhelming. Um, There's a lot of misinformation. It's hard to find things um, from reputable sites, especially about vaccines. And I hear you about being a new mother. You, you just want what's best for your baby. You can't you can't do anything else. Anyway, so the first point here is people talk about the amount of aluminum received over the course of the first six months of a baby's life in food and breast milk versus vaccines. However, the vaccines represent a higher intensity dosage of aluminum rather than a more prolonged exposure over time. Does the intensity of aluminum administered have an impact on its toxicity, especially as it relates to the blood-brain barrier? Are there credible studies addressing that topic? Do we want to do that first and then we can address yeah, sure. the second sure. issue? Yeah, sure. So, um, Vincent, you you um, had some interesting information. I, I think one of the first things we need to um, clarify is it's not aluminum. So we're not talking about like aluminum foil that you wrap food in. <laughs> um, right. it's, it's alum. So it's salts of aluminum that are precipitated. Right. Um, and they you, you found a source that says that they are either aluminum sulfate mixed with sodium or potassium hydroxide. Right. And so... Um, so it what we use this for is an adjuvant. Right. So an, why so we know we need adjuvants for not all vaccines, and that'll be important, um, but only for some of the vaccines in which they induce a poor immune response on their own. So we add mm-hmm. this in to in, to induce the immune response, and so this adjuvant increases the immunogenicity or the ability to induce an immune response. Um, and there are certain vaccines that have this, and certain vaccines that don't. Um, an important point is that the attenuated live vaccines do not have this, and they're, in fact, the ones that people have the most fears about, um, about vaccines and co- correlating with various different diseases that have, uh, um, with papers that have been retracted and discredited that we can go on and on. We have in previous um, episodes. But yeah, so um, if you look at a few studies where they, they look at the pharmacokinetics or the uptake, it, it looks like, they, yes, you are correct. When you inject um, a vaccine, you get like a little blip in the amount of aluminum salts that you get or alum. 
Um, but the amount that you get from the environment is nearly the same. So if you look at accumulation over time, there really isn't isn't a huge um, effect that that amount of the adjuvant has um, on the overall bioaccumulation um, in an infant. I don't know if you have any additions to that or yeah, thoughts. Yeah, so I, I have a, a wonderful book called Vaccines in Your Child by Paul Offit. Mm, yes. And it, it's great because it's written in very straightforward language. And I have a PDF, and he has told me I can give it to anyone. So if you would like it, let me know. But here's what he says. It's actually by... Uh, to people. Here's what they say about aluminum. So aluminum has been used in, in vaccines for 80 years, so we have a lot of time to have evaluated it. There's also a very good uh, page on the CDC website. Yes. And he says, the amount of aluminum in vaccines is far less than a baby will face every day. The aluminum is the third most abundant element on earth, and it's in food and water. Food mm -hmm. is the most common source of aluminum. It's also in teas, herbs, and spices, it's added to leavening agents. It's a pancake mixes, flour, baking powder, cheese, cornbread. It's everywhere. And we eat between 5 and 10 milligrams of aluminum a day. So do babies. And it, they get it in their breast milk as well. And they get way more than aluminum that's in vaccines. So the idea that there's a more concentrated administration of aluminum in vaccines is not really true. It's much right. less than you pull in uh, in your food. Now, a lot of aluminum is bad, but that's way more than you would get in a vaccine. And premature infants uh, are really harmed by aluminum that is that is present in intravenous fluids. People on dialysis who get right. a lot of aluminum in the antacids that they're given have problems. So certain risk groups have problems. Uh, so antacids, which are given to some patients, have 350 milligrams of aluminum per teaspoon. Wow. Hmm. And that's way more than vaccines. So people right. have done a You're lot. You're talking micrograms in vaccines. Yes, micrograms. All right. So um, there are there have been many many studies, and this book by Offit uh, has lots of references of some of these studies at the end. So as I said, if you would like that, um, we can we can provide that to you. So yeah, uh, there's really zero unless you are in these risk groups. You know, a kidney failure, premature infants. Uh, there's no harm from vac from uh, aluminum salts. Right. And there uh, there are none in the live attenuated vaccines like the measles, mumps right. and rubella vaccine, that's which right. is the one that people have a lot of fear about. Yes, that's right. Only the so, inactivated vaccines have them, yeah. That's right. So there so there's no reason not to get the measles vaccine. <laughs> right. <laughs> um so this the this anonymous writer um had a second part to their comment here, and that was the CDC says that you should not administer the second or third dose of certain vaccines to children if they've had an abnormal reaction. Now, this she raises a good point here and says, yet the CDC recommends up to six shots at the same time, three of which can come in a combination vaccine, like the measles, mumps, and rubella, rubella vaccine, right? So how is one to discern which vaccine caused the reaction in this case? So in other words, to rephrase this is if if you take your child in and they get their six month vaccines with like uh, eight different, you know, uh, vaccine components in five or six different shots, how do you know if they have a reaction, which one it is so that you don't give that one again? Right. And it's something that I, I hadn't necessarily thought about because, you know, when you think about an immune allergic reaction, you don't want to give the same one, but yet you don't want to leave this baby unprotected. So how do you know which ones to do? So I went and looked it up um, about what, what are the recommendations for physicians when they have a patient who has a reaction. And so this is from the um, Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices. Um, and so they say for an individual patient who has experienced an immediate reaction to immunization, it's important to identify the type of reaction, obtain a history, and try to identify the particular agent responsible. So that's what we're trying to figure out, right? So they they say that there's an algorithm that's been published, but what they recommend is that they, they um, refer them to an allergist and that the allergist will try and identify which component of which vaccine caused the problem by doing an allergy testing. And then you don't give that one again you give the other vaccines. So if they had a reaction to Haemophilus influenza B, you don't give that one. Or if you find out they have a reaction to egg, then they don't have any with egg in them, 
So, so you can narrow down which, which component of the vaccine and of which vaccine a baby had a reaction to, and then you can eliminate that from future vaccinations, but you shouldn't leave the baby unprotected. So it's the, the idea here is if you, if you have extra severe reaction, understandably, you would not want to go back and, and revaccinate, but it makes a lot more sense to go to an allergist and figure it out because you might contact something later. Like, for example, what if it is egg? Right. And then you go to feed the baby an egg later after they start eating solid foods, you're going to have a big problem. So it's best if they have a reaction. And when, when we're talking a, an allergic reaction, we're talking a severe reaction. And the physician would be right there. They would be able to administer, administer supportive care. These are extraordinarily rare events. Like you're talking a severe reaction to a component that a child has developed an allergy to. Perfect. Great. Perfect. Very yeah, good. that's great. Very good. Steph, can you take the next one? Sure, sure. Um, Niraj writes, dear immunosomes, I know it's been a while since I last wrote, but rest assured that like a lot of folks out there, I am an ardent downloader and follower of the Immune Teams podcast. It is always fun listening to such intriguing stories. And in line with this, the paper discussed in Immune 20 was particularly interesting as someone who spent years working extensively on inflammasome activation during my postdoc years. This story on the effect of activation leading to blood clots was totally fascinating. And yet again, goes to show that there are still several survival mechanisms that are highly controlled and regulated by the innate immune arm. By the way, I was also a close witness to the discovery or anti-discovery of Cas1 knockout uh, mice mm-hmm. actually being Cas Caspase one and Caspase eleven double knockouts, which was pretty intriguing to be honest. We brought that up earlier. Mm-hmm. Since those days, a lot of cool science has been done to show the role of Caspase eleven in cleavage cleavage of Cas gas dermin D and generation of membrane pores that release inflammatory cytokines like IL one beta and IL eighteen. One interesting result that comes back to mind is that one of the inflammasomes, uh, NALP3, is generally not expressed in primary macrophages, and its expression gets induced by PAMPs like LPS, um, although I think it's that was only shown in vitro activation only, which makes me wonder how is the ER, EPRJ protein alone activating the inflammasome? Now, so going back to um, immune 20, I think that they brought that up, that there were, of, there were other activating proteins. I have to go back and look at that paper. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, Cindy, I think that was your paper. It was my paper. Yeah. So uh, I know that there are, I think, I think there are some other things that will both induce the expression of NLRP3 and activate the the caspases to induce cleavage. So I think that the ER, EPR, I can't even say it either. The EPRJ <laughs> protein probably is doing both. How right. we're not exactly sure yet. Right. Um, And so pontificates, maybe it induces expression of the NLRP3 protein. Right. And one question I always have is that even though there are several inflammasomes identified, NALP3 seems to be the most robust and universal in mounting a protective immune response against most proteinaceous PAMPs. I know we shouldn't ask why questions in biology, but maybe something we're speculating on. So please keep up the fabulous podcasting. And I look forward to never getting immune to listening to them. That's cute. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah, I mean, I think that because, well, one, like they mentioned, you know, we there are several inflammasomes, but I don't think we've really looked into the interactions. I'm sure there's ones we haven't discovered yet. Uh, what we can say is that NALP3 is very robust, but the why, it's a great question. Yeah. So, so I think that there's a lot of different NALPs, um, right. And uh, not a, a lot of different NLRs in general. Um, and I think one of the reasons why this one seems so central is because there's something related to perturbances that will activate it. So lots of different things like um, disturbing the lysosomes or ATPs or things like that, that will end up activating NALP3. So the the repertoire of things that we have found that activated are quite broad. And so a central one stimulus is not clear whether all of those things that we have found that do that actually converge on one signal. I don't know. Um in fact, I think, if I remember correctly, one of the things that activates it is actually relevant to the previous question, which was the alum salts. So the uh, the alum adjuvant 
will um, cause uh, the lysosomal um, disruption and activation of NALP hmm. as part of the way it works. Um, if I remember the literature correctly. So I, I you know, I think that, they, that there's a lot of different stimuli of this that have been found, but whether they all converge on some central signal or not, I, I'm not sure if it's really clear yet. All right. Do you want to wrap up with some picks? Sure. Yes, sure. So I just want to draw attention to something um, that's been in the news for a little while, but there's been some updates. So the University of Alaska is facing massive cuts by their new governor. His last name's mm-hmm. Dunleavy. And and really the whole, the general consensus of this is is trying to make on promises to potentially reduce taxes by attacking the higher education system um, because of their uh, the fiscal crisis in the state. A- and you know, when you think back to why Alaska has this issue. I, I mean, I won't even go into the depths of it, but it has a lot to do with oil companies. And now that oil um is decreasing in that state. So the state's oil wealth, there's not as much as there was. And so the, the really the, this governor, the, the, they're going to restructure, they're going to cut costs to be able to accommodate for the dip or the decrease in revenue from oil companies, which by the way, got huge tax breaks to be able to um, drill oil in that state without any, um, you know, really much putting back into education. And so what they did, I think there was a lot of pressure because it would have been $70 million or 135 million was the original budget cut. But today or yesterday was announced that it's going to be halved. So now the cuts are only 70 million over three years. And I just, I think what this represents and is certain administrations attacking higher education by cutting their their budget. And I don't think that we can have strong state and states and strong science without publicly funded institutions. And really these these are the institutions that are they are the ones that are able to give education to the most, the broadest um, background of people, people who come from all different walks of life and who maybe can't get into, you know, it's an easily accessible way for people to get educated. And I just think that paying attention to this because it is Alaska, I don't think it got as much coverage in the beginning, but now has got a lot more focus. So I just want to highlight that if people should follow. Um, And there's a scientist on Twitter. Her name is Dr. Kat Milligan Muir, and she really she's at the university of alaska and you could follow her on twitter for updates but we need to support even uh university of alaska it seems far away but this stuff can happen to all of our state-funded institutions that's Mm. not what you should cut to save money education is the last thing yes right 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 steph what do you i'm sorry cindy what do you have (laughs) so i have um uh, a nature article but there's it's also been in the news quite a bit in the last few days um there are two new ebola treatments that came out um that are um, showing remarkable success um and so you may know that there have been a number of outbreaks including one that i think is currently going on right now with like 1200 people have died or something like that maybe 1900 over the last year or so um and and so ebola is clearly a very deadly disease um as high mortality rate is 90 percent. so they're desperate for anything that will help and uh so a trial uh intermediate announcement was just made on August 12th. Um, and what they showed was that there's basically a 90% protection, which is amazing. Um, if they get early enough treatment. And so the preliminary data on like 500 people. So this isn't a particularly small study showed that, um, there are two different, two different treatments. So one is from Regeneron pharmaceuticals. It's called Regen. EB3. And then the other one is the monoclonal antibody MAB114. Um, and that was the one that was developed by the NIH, the NIAID. So <clears throat> they've tried both of these and one showed that 29% of the people given the Regen uh, EB3 died compared with 34% with a monoclonal antibody. Um, and in contrast, the best that we've ever gotten was 50% of the patients dying with an antiviral drug or 50% with the previous monoclonal antibody. Well, actually, it's not monoclonal antibody, right? It's a, 
it's an antibody purified from someone who uh, survived the Ebola outbreak in 2014, I think. So th- this is compared to n- normally 90% mortality. So you're talking 70, 70, 80% of the people are surviving up to 90% of the people if they catch it early enough are surviving with these therapies. And so it, it is an incredible move forward. Um, and I think it's it's going to change the landscape of Ebola outbreaks if we can get these drugs to these people and contain these outbreaks earlier, because I think it's becoming more and more of a concern because there's more um, movement between populations more than there used to be. I would say um, in when you have an outbreak, it was it used to be contained because it was village specific and now people are trafficking to larger cities. And so there's a concern that you could have a major, major outbreak. Yeah. These are one is a triple monoclonal and the other is one. Yes. So this is great. The only thing is you have to give these intravenously. So you'll have to bring these people to the treatment centers. And seeing as though we're having trouble vaccinating people because of the (laughs) political situation in the DRC, this is going to be true. I mean, it's great, but you have to get it to people. You can have great vaccines. You can have great therapies like this. But if you can't give them to people, they're not really useful. If they they can um, get it to the... Uh, the medical staff that are helping that will help too. Yes, the staff would be great. That would help them from not, so they don't die and they can take care of people for sure. Yep. So my pick, I found when I was looking for a figure last time for last immune, a f- figure of an immune cell, I found this website, blousen.com, and they have wonderful videos of oh, wow. different mm-hmm. aspects of uh, immunology, you know, and you can. Look about vaccines, corticosteroids, poison ivy, myeloid, leukemia, all little videos with nice explanations. 104 different videos on immunology. Wow, this so, is so cool. Could, could be useful for teaching or oh, yes. educating yourself, and they have lots of great uh, images as well. So the the cell in our logo is from Blousen Medical. Yeah. They have nice. herpes virus, allergic rhinitis. Yeah, cool stuff. Oh, neat. Sorry. Love it. Immune 23, immune at microbe.tv if you have questions or comments. If you want to support us at microbe.tv slash contribute, you could use PayPal or Patreon to give us as little as a dollar a month. We would really appreciate your support. Cindy Leifer is at Cornell University on Twitter. Cindy Leifer. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. Great job. Thanks. (laughs) (laughs) Steph Langle is at Duke University. Stephanie Langle on Twitter. Thanks, Steph. Yeah, thanks. This was so fun. I'm Vincent Racaniello at virology.ws music on immune is by steve neal steve neal percussion.com thanks for listening to immune the podcast that's infectious we'll be back next month